Uh, our last speaker of the day is Terry Sanowski, and uh, it's been a very great pleasure of mine to be able to work with him here. Uh, I was looking him up because he needs no introduction, so I thought I'd better look him up. And uh, he has over 150,000 citations, so that makes him, you know, five times the scientist I am. Uh, Terry, take it away. Okay. Uh, well, John set me up, as you'll see in a minute. Let's see if I can share that. Okay, here we are. Go into presentation mode. Okay, so this title is by far the longest title that I've ever used for a, a talk. And it's in the format for a Jeopardy clue. So, you know, in Jeopardy, you answer with a question. You're given some hint and you have to answer what is the question to which that's the answer. And so here it is. Uh, what does stochastic resonance, synaptic plasticity and space time codes have in common? And if I were uh, in person here, I'd wait for the audience to shout out the right answer. And the right answer is traveling waves. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and, uh, and so that's really the well, theme. Terry, Terry, you would have gotten it wrong. You'd have to be, what? Oh, <laughs> right. What are traveling waves? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, uh, and by the way, this, this is a historical thing. Why, why do they have this convoluted way? And the reason is that there was a period during which quiz shows were corrupt and, and they, they were getting uh, answers. And so there was a law that you couldn't answer questions on TV. <laughs> so, they, 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 you know, it's a legal uh, way to get around that. Okay, so if we look at the history of uh, neurophysiology recordings from the cortex, uh, you can see here in my diagram that you've already seen in, in Gert's talk that uh, there's been a tremendous uh, amount of information we've gathered from looking at the response properties of single neurons. And uh, of course, uh, this is made possible by the microelectrode. And you know, if you do that uh, and record from enough neurons, you can get a, a sample, usually a few hundred, and enough to write a paper with tuning curves. Now, the problem is that it's, so, it's going to be very difficult to get a big picture because it's equivalent to trying to see the world through a soda straw, one pixel at a time. You know, it, it's, it's just, it takes a Herculean effort and uh, to, to look at the, the, the forms and the relationships between the pixels. But, uh, but nonetheless, that was a good place to start. Well, we're now in a completely different situation because we can record from, as you saw in John's case, uh, almost 100 electrodes, which means you can record from many, many neurons simultaneously. And also uh, with uh, neuropixels, you can record from multiple areas at the same time. So, you know, we, we're now getting a global picture and that's really gonna be the theme of my talk. So first stochastic resonance, okay? What is stochastic resonance? So uh, this is a picture of, based on one that you saw from John's talk. So this is a marmoset a recording with Utah Ray. And, and I just wanna point out a couple of things about the, the, this, this field potential uh, down in, 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 in the top here, which is that it's uh, highly noisy up, uh, in terms of fluctuations, but also the, the period between the peaks is quite variable. It's very broad band. This is not a narrow sine wave. This is very broad band. And, and, and really the question, and you saw that the, the experimental data is no doubt that uh, this, traveling wave here, the phase of it is important for being able to detect the stimulus. So the, if you go back to physics, and this has been around for, you know, maybe 40, 50 years, um, and, and ask, you know, if you have weak signal, and so suppose the signal is this, this simple sine wave down here, and you have a uh, threshold, and um, you're, you're trying to detect it, uh, you, 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 have to, you have to be near threshold, but uh, suppose we, we, uh, we, we were stuck with this uh, signal. How can we enhance the signal to noise? As I say, the output, the system output. One is by adding noise. 
If you add some weak noise, you get a weak output. If you add too much noise, you just basically flood the output and there's no signal anymore. So these are the, the two extremes. But if you look at somewhere in between, there's an optimal noise so that it just crosses the uh, threshold at the peaks. And that gives you a nice signal to noise. And that's what we see. So in, the, in a sense, uh, traveling waves could be a way of, of, of using stochastic resonance to enhance weak signals. And, um, and, and by the way, this is an old idea. Uh, during World War II, they, they had these uh, you know, big guns that were, they had these gears um, and they had problems with freezing in the sense that if you wanted to move the gun a little bit, you have to put a lot of force into it and then it would suddenly jump. And so they got around that by adding noise. So that literally, they just added noise jitter to the uh, to to the, the force, and that's like adding grease. It's basically a way of making the whole system more fluid. Okay, synaptic plasticity, and this is something you saw in Gert's talk, which is a uh, spike time dependent plasticity. And uh, we 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 see here this is a, 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 a diagram of the relative time between an input spike and an output spike. So here's uh, on the right is when the presynaptic input occurs before the postsynaptic spike, the re recording from the postsynaptic neuron, delta T is positive. If you pair that at 10 Hertz or higher uh, and vary the time delay, you can see that you can more than double, you can about double the change in the synaptic plasticity, the, the plasticity, the, the synaptic strength, if it's within a window of about 10, 20 milliseconds. And similarly, if, if you have a post before pre and vary that time interval, you can decrease the strength of the synapse I factor of two within about 10, 20 milliseconds. So, the, so relative timing makes a big difference here. And this has been found in the, the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus and the spiriculiculus and many other places in the brain. Okay, now, um, so Let's think about STDP in the context of, say, the hippocampus. So the hippocampus, we know, is very important for long-term memory. And when an animal is uh, exploring its environment, there's a very strong uh, theta. It's, it's a, a very, uh, it's probably the biggest uh, oscillation in, in, in the rodent cortex, uh, the, the, the hippocampus in this case. And the, it's, it was always thought to be synchronous across the entire extent of the longitudinal extent of the hippocampus, as we see here, looking down dorsally. Uh, so Thanosiapus put in an array of electrodes and here's recordings simultaneously from this array. And, and here are the outputs. And let's just look at one uh, line here in green. We can see that there's a phase delay across the hippocampus and Bujaki has replicated this and shown that as a pi uh, phase difference from one end to the other. Now, what this means is that if the hippocampus is using STDP to strengthen the synapses between different neurons within the cortex that this relative timing of the traveling wave is going to be very, very important. Now, uh, and I'm going to play a, a move for you so to convince you of that just like John did. Now, the, here's the problem. Uh, people who study the hippocampus know about this, but they ignore it because they, they, it doesn't fit into any conceptual structure. They, you know, it's there, but you know, they do the experiments, they record from a, from a particular part of the hippocampus and then they report the results. Uh, but uh, you know, if, if, this, if time, the time it has to be taken into account, these time delays are really important. And, and that's what theoretical modeling should be able to do to help us understand what, what possible impact could it possibly have. Now let's go get back to sleep, right? This whole workshop is, is really, telling us something about sleep. And we've already seen evidence from Lisa's talk about the importance of sleep and memory consolidation and many other studies that have corroborated this. And uh, I'm gonna be just focusing on one particular phase of sleep, namely uh, uh, non-REM stage two, because that's the period of sleep between um, slow wave and REM back and forth during the night. That's the kind of you, you can't get from one to the other without going through stage two. And, and for some people, they spend half the night in stage two. And it, it's in stage two that you get these very characteristic sleep spindles 
and K complexes. This is what uh, Eric was talking about. The sleep spindles, they last for one or two seconds, you know, 10 to 14 hertz. And uh, they're known to be important for memory consolidation. That is to say, if, if you reduce them, you remember less uh, uh, than you would if you had more. So it, again, it was thought for many, many years that it, the sleep spindles were, first of all, uh, found throughout the cortex, but also synchronous. And, and the proof of it is shown here. Mircea Steriad studied these by recording intracellularly and also by looking across the cortex. And in this case, six electrodes in the thalamus where the sleep spindles originate, and then two electrodes in the cortex, and that they're shown here. And here they're blown up. This is, uh, as you can see, five seconds. And uh, uh, the, you know, they look like they're pretty, you know, they start in the, in, the, in the thalamus, but they very quickly entrain the cortex and become synchronous across it. But what, synchronous to what degree? And, and uh, there's a big battle that uh, Mircea had with David McCormick, who said, no, 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 they, there's, they're, 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 it's not synchronous, it's they're gonna be phase differences. And, uh, and Hollandus X and I modeled both their experiments, uh, we modeled Mircea's, which was an intact uh, in vivo, and we were able to replicate his, his results. And then we looked at Dave McCormick's slice preparations. And again, the connections were disrupted. We modeled that and we got his results. So it's clear that they're both right, but they were looking at very different preparations. Now, we had the opportunity to work with uh, Sid Cash and Eric Hallgren recording ECOG recordings from the surface of the cortex of epilepsy patients. And these are patients who, as a last resort, uh, drug resistant epilepsy, have uh, been recording to see where the focus is of the, of the epilepsy before doing the operation. It's a eight by eight grid. And here are some recordings. And I wanna just focus here and you can see that uh, although Black is, is uh, the average, there's a, a spread. And the question is, is that just noise? And what does it look like if we actually play it? And here's the movie. This is by Lyle Muller, who did the, was also a co-author co uh, on the paper that John Reynolds told you about. And here, it, 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 there's, there's a very interesting spatial uh, here, a spatial organization in which the peak rotates around from, from prefrontal to temporal, to parietal, right? I mean, and, and, and it's, it's really, we, we, we uh, have recorded tens of thousands of these uh, sleep spindles and uh, they're, they're, about half of them are the ones that you just saw and the other half are, are, can go in the opposite direction or more complex, okay. And, and if we just look at one cycle, uh, looking at the phase change, the arrows are pointing in degree of where it's changing the fastest, it's a very nice, uh, kind of a swirl, of, uh, which is a characteristic of, of, of this kind of uh, pattern. Now, we were uh, concerned because of the fact they were epilepsy patients. Could this be abnormal? Uh, their cortex does have uh, abnormal periods. So we were, collaborated with April Benesich, who records high-density EEG in babies. And we were very fortunate because they have very thin skulls at that stage, you know, six uh, 12 and 18 months old babies and the sutures haven't even closed. And so I'm gonna play uh, uh, again, a movie of, of what it looks like now across all the hemispheres, the two hemispheres. And it's rotating, but you can see that it's coherent across the hemispheres and it rotates. And, and it, it, this, this is very, very, uh, you know, the, 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 the actual, uh, Spindle amplitude is actually much higher in the baby than it is uh, at the scalp of, you, of an adult. Now, okay, now here's where plasticity comes in because of the fact that uh, we know that there are long range connections between these cortical areas that have time delays in them. And the time delays are typically tens of milliseconds. And so what's going on? So here's, here's a cartoon to tell us about what, what might be going on. So shown here on, on the left are two brain areas, A and B, separated by 20 milliseconds of an axon with 20 millisecond time delay. Now let's suppose that the, uh, the spindle was absolutely synchronous at the two sites. So here's the burst occurring at the, the peak of the spindle. And now there's a 20 millisecond delay 
from A going to B. And it's always going to be the case that it's going to arrive after the spikes in B. That is to say, uh, post before pre, post before pre. And that'll drive down, by the way, in, in a 10 hertz range. And that will drive down the strengths of these long range connections. And so what this would predict is that at the end of all the sleep that you do, you would end up with a disconnected cortex. So clearly that, that's not viable. But if we look at uh, the time, taking into account the 20 millisecond time delay and then it takes 20 milliseconds to go from A to B, then it arrives at just the right time so that you can, STDP will give you both potentiation and depression depending on the relative timing. So this makes it possible for plasticity to occur and it might be the substrate for what's going on in, in one of the mechanisms for plasticity uh, during uh, memory consolidation. Now this is only gonna work if the actual timing, the jitter is small and, and without going into detail, uh, if you look at the, whether two successive cycles have the same a pattern, you know, the, 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 what the arrows that you saw, the phase uh, diagram, the, uh, then it turns out that this mid spread is in the millisecond range. So it's clearly, and it turns out that if the first two are, uh, are very highly correlated, you know, close to 0.9, uh, 0.8.9, then that very same pattern will reappear hundreds of times during the night, suggesting that there's some patterns that are more important than others. Now, this is what John didn't get around to uh, telling you about, but uh, this is a, uh, a very simple model. And the question is, can we get something that looks like these traveling waves uh, out of uh, uh, the, the, uh, a, a model in which has, it's called a ring model in which all of the uh, units are connected primarily with their nearest neighbors. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the strength uh, decreasing with the uh, square of the distance uh, inverse e to the minus uh, d squared. Plus, uh, we're going to also have a time delay that's proportional to the distance. So this this kind of a simple model, one-dimensional model of a two-dimensional cortex. Now, uh, if you look at the power spectrum, there's nothing unusual about it. Uh, we, we, we actually, uh, this is a, a project that was done by a, uh, a visiting student from France. And you know he 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 tried varying all the parameters, and it was very very difficult. It's very easy to get a dense traveling wave where all the units are activated, and it's, it's like a tidal wave that goes around. And this is a very good model for epilepsy. You know, dense activity patterns, and you have spike and wave, and then there's a recovery period. But no, we, we need we wanted to get sparse waves, and we couldn't get it with a hundred. Uh, we couldn't get it with a thousand. It wasn't until we got up into the tens of thousands and near 100,000 that we suddenly struck gold and were able to demonstrate that, that uh, it was possible to get sparse traveling ways. And by the way, you know, there are thousands of models out there, these ring models and others that, that don't put in time delays. And so they, they never actually looked at this regime. Um, okay, so let's play a simulation and uh, the, uh, <clears throat> Excitatory input of the unit is up and, and the little blue thing tells you what the pattern of activity as it spreads across the network. And as you can see, it is very nicely coherent. And in fact, uh, the, some of these traveling waves go through each other, uh, which is uh, because it's sparse. If you do a Fourier analysis, spatial temporal, you can see the slope here on the bottom right uh, is, the, is basically the speed of the traveling wave. And here's now a nice uh, diagram to show that, uh, time along the x-axis and the uh, neuron number. There's, in this case, we had 80,000 uh, 80, units. And, and you can see the uh, uh, diagonal lines uh, corresponding to waves going in both directions. Okay, finally, I'm gonna talk about a new conceptual framework. Uh, and so th this, so th I've, I've gone through two possible uses for traveling ways. And by the way, they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, there may be many uses of traveling ways because they're, they're all over the place. Uh, well, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, Lyle, uh, Fre Frederic Chavon, John Reynolds and I wrote a review uh, in which we looked at the literature. We did a search for literature on papers that reported traveling ways. We found over a hundred. It turns out that they've been found almost in every structure 
including, as John mentioned, invertebrates, right? In uh, olfactory uh, structures in, lean, in, in the snail and in turtle cortex. So, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a natural dynamic tendency of, of, of cortical tissue of, of, of all sorts. Um, and the question is, you know, what, why is it there? Uh, it's been it, it universally ignored. People don't know what to do with it. What's, what, what function does it have? Uh, and in fact, uh, here, here's an interesting uh, kind of a footnote here. Um, why were they missed uh, earlier? Uh, you know, even, even before, well, if, you can, if you're only recording from one location with one electrode, you'll never see a traveling wave, right? You've got to record from multiple places at the same time. And that's why it came later, much later. It, it, and, and it was, again, uh, something that couldn't fit into the existing conceptual framework, which is being built up by single unit recordings. But in any case, uh, we, we summarized all of the data and then we came up with what we thought were possible ways that we could understand the, the, uh, the, the, the consequences. And, and uh, John's paper is really an important one because it's the first one that has shown any uh, impact of, of, tra of traveling waves or oscillations in, uh, on behavior. And by the way, that's another <laughs> issue. Um, it, you know, it, again, if you record just one electrode, you get beautiful these oscillations, and uh, it's you don't see the traveling waves. But what 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 you do see, though, is that uh, these oscillations are modulated by behavior. They are modulated by behavior, by attention, and a lot of other things. But uh, but uh, so a causal effect uh, was much more difficult, and so th that's I think why we, you know, John and I put so much effort into this. And by the way, uh, he, he, he had to tell you, didn't tell you the story of, of how it got into nature because that was a battle that lasted uh, like a year or two. Because uh, the reviewers, although they were very good reviewers, you know, they, 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 they basically um, uh, you know, were putting a very high bar. We had to make sure that we, we were able to convince the uh, the reviewers, and we, um, you know, and it was worthwhile because we we I think we have a very solid paper. But of, amongst the th possible functions for traveling waves, and I highly recommend the paper in neuro, neuro, this uh, Nature Reviews of Neuroscience. Uh, there was one that uh, came out of a study that was done by some physicists. It was published in Physical Physical Review Letters, um, which is like uh, you know science or nature for physicists. And, and, and it was a, a, a experimental study. And what they did was they, they dropped a styrene sphere onto an oil bath that was oscillating up and down. And it, it would hop because it's immiscible. It would hop up and down. And, and you can see the hops here, right? In, in uh, the blue, say, going up and down, up and down, up and down. But as it, every time it hit, it caused a ripple in the surface of the oil, and and so uh, every and and those would interfere with each other and form interference patterns. Now here is what they were able to show, uh, uh, you know, both ex experimentally here and and mathematically, is that if you take a picture like you have on the left there, and all you see is an interference pattern, you can invert this and predict the previous history. Of the, 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 of the bouncing uh, ball. In, in other words, the, the, the entire history has been somehow uh, been in, 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 in sort of uh, combined in terms of the uh, different spatial locations, much like a hologram uh, where you have interfering light waves can reproduce a three-dimensional object. Uh, again, you know, if you, if, you, if you do the right inversion, and, and this gives rise to another conceptual framework, uh, which, for which there's no real evidence, except I think um, th th I th it's very attractive and I'm, I'll try to explain it. Uh, let's think about neural codes. And this is something that uh, neuroscientists and especially a computational neuroscience love to argue about, right? This is argument's been going on for decades. And, of course, you know, the early work that was done by Hubel and Weasel uh, used the rate code, 
uh, as the measure of response, in which, which has a signal. It's a very nice uh, signal. Uh, however, uh, as John pointed out, because of the variability, they had to average over many trials. In fact, in, for some trials, there's no response at all. How could that be if your perception depends on you know, seeing things on one trial, right? There's gotta be some reason for it. We now know that some fraction of that has to do with the fact that there are these traveling ways going back and forth. And if you happen to be at the trough, then you'll, you'll miss it. Okay, well, uh, so, that's, so that's the traditional uh, rate code, but then you know, some, uh, uh, there, there's some evidence for uh, other uh, codes. By the way, there's no, no reason why, again, you can't have many different uh, neural codes. And, and we know that in the periphery there are in terms of being able to code sensory inputs. So, uh, there are, so time codes. Uh, are, are uh, also possible. And, and the idea here is that use the, the temporal dimension as another variable that you could use for either encoding information or would say in the case of spike time dependent plasticity, being able to make a decision about whether you're gonna store information, right? There's many, many tasks that the, the brain has to accomplish and why not use multiple codes? <laughs> Uh, so the, 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 here's, here's the, the, the reason why this is a, a, the argument between these two codes is, is, is really a false one because who determines, a rate code means so many spikes over some interval, right? Well, who picks the interval, right? It, let's vary it. If, we, if, if it's 100 milliseconds, you know, you might get uh, five spikes or two spikes, I don't know. But uh, as it gets shorter and shorter, you get at some point where you're only going to have one spike per interval. Well, that, that means that by varying over the, the interval that you look at over, over, over you know, from, from short to long, uh, you, you have information encoded in, in, both, in both ways. And really what's important is not how it's encoded, it's how it's decoded. In other words, who, what's the interval that you're averaging over? <laughs> and it could well, and we know that's, it, it, that neurons are very sensitive to coincidences of spikes. So it, it, it is, it, it's very likely that it's somewhere in between. Uh, or, or multiple, multiple locations in different neurons. But, but here, here's the idea though, is that it, it, if you look at these two codes again from a, a, a kind of the conceptual framework that people are arguing with them, they're really the same. Spike rates, rate codes, spike rates in a population of neurons at a moment of time represent sensory events in the world at a moment of time, right? You, you see the spikes, you say that I flashed the stimulus and that is what is representing the stimulus. It's the spikes in that neuron at that time. Time code, spike times in a population of neurons representing sensory events at a moment of time. Everybody uh, assumes that what's going on is that you're encoding uh, sensory and motor events at a given time, at a moment of time. But there's an alternative, which traveling waves have raised, which is what I call a space-time code. Because think what's happening. A stimulus comes in, we know that st there's stimulus evoked in addition to the spontaneous waves that John showed, there's stimulus evoked waves. So you have a stimulus comes in, it causes a wave, just like you saw in that oil bath. And then another stimulus comes in and another stimulus and they interfere with each other, which means that you have information spreading in, within an area of the cortex. What that means is that the spikes that are firing are being driven not just by what's happening at this moment in time, but also what happened a, a short time before through a window of time. So the, the spike rates and both the spike rates and spike times in the population neurons at a moment of time represent sensory events over an interval of time. And this is conceptually a very different animal from the ones that we're thinking about because it, it's really, you've you, it's gonna be very difficult to sort of unravel this because it's like a hologram. It's like, you know, you're trying to get, you're trying to get your hand on something. And, and the beauty of encoding an interval of time is that the information is present there and can be projected to the next area, not just what's happening now, but what's happened over the last 100 milliseconds, say V1 to V2, and that could continue. And so by the time you get to infratemporal cortex, you could be talking about some summary over a second or longer. And this might make it much easier to see rather than have to put together a lot of things happening sequentially in time. And by the way, physics has already gone through this. There was a time when everybody believed in Newtonian physics where space and time were separate and 
They never two could be mixed. And when I was a graduate student at Princeton, I worked with John Wheeler, who was a very famous physicist. And he was the one who uh, coined the term black hole. But he published this really wonderful book on space-time physics about relativity, which was you know, over 100 years ago, where physicists realized that, no, space and time can be mixed. It depends on how fast you're going. And that completely changed physics, right? I mean, it was a different conceptual framework. It took, them a long, it took physicists a long time to, to, to understand the consequences of that new framework. And it, it really did change the, you know, how physicists think about the world, the universe. And so uh, what, what I think we need to do is to rethink and, uh, with all the new techniques that are being developed, uh, how to interpret those signals. So here are my collaborators, um, special shout out for Lyle Muller, who was really uh, the spark plug for both the sleep study and the marmoset study. Uh, you know, Eric and Sid, uh, April and Sue Peters, who worked with April. Uh, and then of course, John and Zach. So uh, I, I salute you and I hope that you, uh, as you sleep tonight and it consolidates <laughs> that you'll wake up tomorrow morning with a new conceptual framework. And, and that will be the end of my talk.